Are you guys still awake? You had a, did you go out last night? No? Well, I did, so I'm sorry. Um, all right, so my name is Matt Aymanetti, and we're gonna be talking about designing APIs, and especially in the world of audio. Uh, who's listening to music here? Okay, I see some people who actually don't listen to music. That's surprising. <laughs> Before we start, um, I just want to have a minute of silence for my friend Frances, uh, who's stuck in Chicago. So uh, if you can tweet at him and tell him you think of him, take a photo of that probably. Uh, Frances was really, really bummed not to be able to make it. I'm really, really bummed because I was looking forward to hanging out with him. Uh, but yes. Let's take 10 seconds of silence for Francis. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so let's talk about uh, who I am first. So I'm the CTO and co-founder of a company called Splice. And at Splice, uh, we basically reinvented Git, GitHub, and Spotify, but for music producers. So what that means is we created version control for music, so musicians who work on their computers can uh, save their project and they get a full tree, they get version control, they can add collaborators, they can release the project publicly, uh, you get big names releasing tracks, and then you can actually open it in the audio software they use and see how that was being done, and you can have multiple versions. There's also a marketplace where you can buy samples and loops. Most of you probably don't care, but if you love music, and if you have any questions, you can tweet at me later on or come and see me. Uh, and my Twitter handle, I didn't put it in the right slide, is MattTT. All right, uh, why do I care about music and why did I start this company? Well, the first thing is I started as a sound engineer. I was a sound engineer a long time ago and I moved into programming and then went back to the world of music. And today, most music is being produced on computers. In the case of Skrillex, he does everything on his laptop. He actually does even his own mixing, mastering, everything on his computer. Um, also, there's a big community of remixing. People take tracks, modify them, collaborate on tracks, and release them. And finally, it's not just EDM and hip hop. You have people like Adele. Adele worked on her, her album 25, and she only used one MacBook Pro, the same laptop I have here. Uh, she had Logic, which is a software that costs $200 from, from Apple, and then a really nice microphone she probably paid like $500 for. Uh, and she did everything on one computer. So the world is really changing where the same way programmers have discovered that by doing collaboration, by using great tools, we can make good progress. Musicians are discovering the same things, but they don't yet have the tools. Now on the other side, as consumers, you probably listen to music on a lot of different platforms, you do it different ways all the time. And that means that audio lives with you everywhere you go. Last night I was walking on the beach and I was listening to Spotify on my cell phone and I'm like, this is amazing. I can choose the music, whatever music I want, wherever I want, and this is great. But how does it really work and how can we consume this music uh, with this sound using Go? So together, we're gonna go through the process I went through to design an API to consume audio files. So let's talk about designing. Designing an API is not simply thinking about what you want to build. When you look at the definition in the Oxford English Dictionary, designing means to, for, uh, to form a plan to arrange or conceive in the mind full letter execution. Execution is part of design. You cannot just think about something and that's design. Design is to go through implementation, and implementation is to go through interaction, and interaction will probably feed back into new ideas that will go back into implementation and that's a long cycle. It's not as simple as let me think about something and let me, let me just get it done uh, really quickly. So how does it work? We need to talk about audio basics uh, and audio signal. Who knows about audio signal processing? Do we have any people knowing? Wow, that's way more than I expected. Uh, this is actually not as, it's pretty simple, but let me explain quickly. As I'm speaking, I'm pushing air into the microphone. So there's pressure coming through a membrane, and the membrane is being converted by the microphone into a voltage. And the voltage is going through an analog to digital converter, and that will go in digital, and it will become ones and zeros, and it might get processed, there might be EQ, there might be something coming up, and then the audio might come out back into digital to analog, and then to a speaker. Now, Really, what it means to do the analog to digital conversion is that we have this 
signal, so that's uh, a voltage that keeps on going, so you have a continuous signal, and we need to convert it into what's called a discrete signal, which we need to, we need to sample. In digital form, we don't have a continuous signal. We, we have to represent these things by numbers, and we need to have these dots. So these dots look like that. You have the voltage that come in, and we need to sample, meaning we need to take one value at a time as often as we need. Now the resolution of the sample means um, what is the data type I'm gonna use to define the amplitude of my volume, or my the amplitude of the signal. So if you look at it, you can see it's getting louder, less loud, louder, less loud. We need to be able to define the, this loudness, this amplitude, and we're gonna give it a number. And this number will be defined by the way, uh, the, what we call the bit depth. So it could be 8 bits, 16 bit, 34 bits, whatever. Um, the frequency in which we sample, so how often do we actually take a value is called the sample rate. And that's very important because if we don't sample fast enough, we might not get the right resolution. I'm not gonna go into the boring technical details. I could talk for hours about that. But if you listen to a CD, we have a resolution of a sample rate of 4,400 uh, 4, hertz, which means that 44,100 4, times a second, we took a value of the analog signal and we kept that value. And now we also use a 16-bit, meaning that this value was in a range of minus 32,000 to plus 32,000. Now this is great, but you might be wondering why do we sample at that sample rate? And very quickly, it's because of these two amazing guys. Um, and this lady, I guess, she's actually, I explain why, but. Uh, so Nyquist and Shannon are two scientific, scientists uh, that were at the beginning of last century that were working on uh, the, the telegraph, at least Nyquist was. And the telegraph, where when you, you know, you were doing like beep, 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 sending messages like that. And they were looking at how much data they can actually push, push through the pipe, which is a problem we actually, as engineers going through right now with the webs, like how do you get things to go faster? And they, they realize, well, there's physical laws and we cannot go uh, more than twice the bandwidth. So they, they went through this process and they said, okay, if we want to keep the entire signal without any distortion, we need to go, we need to sample at twice the sample, the, the frequency range we need. And humans can hear from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. So we need to go to twice the maximum, which is 44,000. Uh, and that's how, well, it's 40,000. And because of another reason that I won't go into, but technical limitations, they went to 4,400. Um, so that's how sampling works. Now you understand the basics, but that's not it, right? Sampling is, is done uh, by a device, usually on your computer or somewhere else. We need to be able to figure out how we're gonna store this information because that's what we're gonna be retrieving. So when we have a sample, it could be an integer or a, or a float, uh, meaning it could be 162 or 162.0. That's important, but it's super annoying. Uh, there's also the bit rates, the, the bit depth, so it could be 16 bit, 8 bit, 32. Then we're gonna represent this data. So when you have this 162, if you convert it into, into bytes, you have the endianness, meaning are the bytes flipped? Do we start by the, the, the least value bit, bit or the, the, the highest value bit? So you convert that into the base two and you get to 10100010000. And that's the value for one sample that we're gonna store into a file format. Now remember, we're doing that more than 44,000 times a second. So it's a lot of data coming into the file, and we need to know when you look at the file how that's being organized. So now that you have the basics, and you probably didn't care too, too much about it, but at least you'll know, and one day you'll tell your kids you learn about it, we can all write a Go program to know how we're gonna be reading this code. So let's write a file reader and writer. Um, it would be great if I could get a WAV file and I would read it, and then I'll be able to process it and maybe apply a delay or an effect or something like that, and then uh, save it back to, to disk. But we need to go through uh, a process design. And uh, Fred Brooks wrote a really good book called The Design of Design, and he's explaining the process he went through when he designed this, the, the um, System 360, one of the first uh, personal computers. And basically, he reads like that. You first need to, to define a goal. You have an, a desiderata, 
you have utility function, I'll explain what I mean. You have some constraints, and then you have a design tree of decision. And that's the part that's interesting, and you can see uh, it was not writing Go, but you can all read this code. So until it's good enough, or the time runs out, you need to start doing another design, and uh, you want to improve the utility function. The utility function is basically what they call also the goodness function, which means you, how do we evaluate the fact that things are good or they're bad. Um, so we're gonna try to improve that. If the design, until the design is complete, we try again to find uh, remaining options for the design. We make other de decisions and we come back. If it didn't go through, we backtrack. And then we, if it works well, we explore a new path until we're happy with it. And then we take the best design. Now, what do we want to do? We want to um, consume an audio stream. And the data are a unified API. We want fast and low memory. So we want a fast program, but we want low memory usage. And we want that code to be extensible because I want to be able to take this audio and do something with it. Maybe I want to detect if there is silence or something else. All right, so technically, we probably want something like that. I get this file, I read it, and I get all the samples. And then I can apply my own function called effect that takes my slice. Uh, and then I would apply whatever mathematic operation I want on it, and then I will store it back on the file. So if you look at, to, at the wave format, it, it gets a bit scary, because this is the file representation. So this is um, the binary representation of the file, and you can see they have this concept of chunks. Uh, and it actually comes from Reef, which is also used for images, they thought they were being clever. It's actually, we've been using it for 30 years, so I guess it's really not that bad. Uh, but you define the chunk ID, so you're saying, hey, I'm starting this chunk because they could be in different orders, and the chunk is gonna be at that size, so make sure you read all the way to there. And we're gonna tell you this is the format, so this is a wave five point sense. And then we have a second, check, uh, second chunk that says, this is, I want this other, the other size, uh, this audio format is that, uh, we have X amount of channels, the sample rate, the byte rate, which um, means something else we don't need to care about. We have some block line, bits per sample, and then finally we get to what's called the PCM data, which is all the values we cared about, this uh, value that we're being sampled to so all the red dots we had at the beginning. Now the problem is we have these num channels. Now num channels mean that we cannot just have a long slice of all these values because we have to have this concept of audio frame, right? So we sample, but not just one way. We, si we sample at least two if it's stereo. So you have left and right. The problem is that it gets really complicated because we have like all these fancy surround the formats. You have fix around like three channel, left, right, and center. So it becomes super complicated to have one API that fits all these things. So probably before we start writing this API, we should look at what other people have done. So uh, designers call that looking at exemplars. And exemplars are things that were done in the past. And I think as you design an API, it's very important for you to look at what other people have done. Um, so take the models, look at what, what people did, and try to come up with your own version of what you liked, you didn't like, and move on from there. So what Fred Brooks says is that even, even normal designs derive from earlier artifacts. There's really nothing new uh, in design. It's always based on a different idea. And usually the best designers who kind of mess up, it's not they mess up because they didn't design thing right, it's because they designed the wrong thing. So it's very important to look at what other people have done. And audio was, as has been done in a lot of different languages, Python is very common, uh, and here's the, the API, if you use standard library in Python, you say wave open the file, you say that you want to read it, and then you need to start asking a bunch of questions, because you remember all these different fields that were giving you the number of channels, the number of frames, and the audio frames is, if you remember, if it's stereo, that means you have, uh, you have two uh, values in your slice, so we're getting the amount of frames, and then for each of the frames, we're gonna get the wave bytes. But now the problem is I only have bytes and I need to decode them into a value I can use. And it's really hard, so I don't know what to do. Also, small comments. Uh, 
you should totally put emojis in all your code comments. It's really more fun when you debug and then you see them coming. Go supports that very well, so please add emojis. Uh, I like to use the poop one, just when there's a bug and we know it's probably gonna come out. Um, it makes you smile, like, oh, you're super upset there's a bug, but at least you're like a poop emoji, it makes you feel good. Uh, this is SciPy in Python. Uh, the API is different, it looks easier, um, but I could not get it to work well, and I'm not really good. Uh, Francesca is better at Python than me, but here you, you're reading a file, and then you can look through them, and then the problem is, I don't know how you, how you know how many channels you have. So that's a very common issue. It's like, well, you can get this thing, and I will get a, I'll get a bunch of bytes, but I actually don't, that, I'll get the value. So here I actually get an int, but I just don't know what I do for the second channel. So here I put zero, because I know there's at least one channel, but what if I have more channels? Uh, and I was looking, and people on, ha on different forums were saying, well, you should use this guy plus this guy. And I'm like, wow, that's not really great. Um, data formats are hard because I could have my samples in 8, 16, 24, 32, 64-bit integers. They could be signed or not, meaning that they could be between 0 and 64,000 or be between minus 32 to plus 32. Uh, they could also be floats or they could be bytes. And really, it makes designing the API extremely, really hard. So I looked at C. Uh, that's a library we actually use at work. Uh, and C works quite well. The problem is you need to have eight functions. And I'm not gonna go into the description of what it does, but basically you can tell by the fact that some are called read short and the other one is called, that we're reading floats or we're reading integer, and then we're gonna read that into uh, a pointer of short in float or double. And you can see when you have, a, you have a developer who just wants to read a node of file and they have to figure out which of these eight functions they need to read, it's not really great, even though it works well. So to summarize, the API design constraints that we have. One is the sample rate can change very frequently. The bit depth can change. The literal type, so are we setting ints, unsigned ints, float bytes, uh, would also be different. We can have multiple channel value. It could be from one channel to eight or more. We also have a different encapsulation. So what I show you about the wave format being a certain way, if you were doing an AIF file, the, the encapsulation is actually different. Um, we also might need to process things in a different format than what we get. So let's say we're getting a file that's an int, uh, that has a bunch of ints, but we want to do math and we want to do them in float, we'll need to do the conversion of this thing. And finally, uh, we're gonna want to use these contents in different contexts. It could be just for playback on hardware. You might want to just gather the information to know the duration of an audio file. You might want to convert them, manipulate, do analysis. So um, I was working on this project and uh, Yana from the Go team was also thinking about what to do for Go Mobile. I was like, we really want to do playback. There's hardware built in into it. We should have an API. I'm like, oh, that's amazing. I've also been working on that because I want to do audio processing. So we came together and then we realized these challenges were actually really hard to solve. And as we went through the code, uh, we found this snippet of code. Uh, this is inside uh, the Objective-C Coco, uh, I think it's audio core or core audio. Uh, there's this tiny little struct that's used in some places that says, hey, we have an audio buffer. This audio buffer describes, uh, it's a struct, it describes how many channels you have, uh, the byte size, meaning the, the bit depth. Uh, I believe in this case, uh, no, yeah, the bit dev. And then you have this nice hack in C, which is a void star. You can put any data you want. It doesn't really matter. We'll know how to retrieve it from the outside. Now, this is not exactly what we wanted to do, but I really like the idea of saying, like, why don't we use just a buffer? And instead of thinking about decoders and encoders, we don't. We focus on the buffer. And kind of the design idea is like, okay, let's focus on. Let's forget about the encoder and the decoder for now. Let's, let's write them the way we, we know how to do it. And in her case, uh, she cared about doing byte output to the hardware. In my case, I wanted to go back to a file. So like, let's forget about this thing. Let's get it into an audio buffer and let's interact with this audio buffer so everybody can interact with it. And then we could do things like that where you could read or write from a buffer. It doesn't really matter. This is this one entity that we share. And then we would write different processors so we could chain uh, way of writing 
processors and analyzers and all these things. And instead of having an interface for the decoder and the encoder, let's have this one struct that would be the buffer that we will share around. And that's kind of a big shift because, especially at the beginning when we started, we wanted to define an interface because we always talk about behaviors. And the idea is to get that into the standard library because Go doesn't currently support uh, audio processing. So we came up with this structure, uh, which is a PCM buffer. Uh, so PCM stands for pulse, wow, I forgot now. Never mind, it, is, it stands for something very, very interesting, uh, which just means you have the sample values. Uh, something modulation, pulse, no, I forgot code. to see. Code. Code. code, pulse code modulation, thank you. So you get your PCM buffer, the, the f as it has a format, that's a pointer, we'll look at what it is, to a specific format. And here, because we don't have generics in Go, which sometimes makes me sad, and that was one of these cases, we need to define uh, three different slices. One for ints, one for floats, one for bytes. Now, we don't want to use them all at once, but we're gonna have to have them available so we can store the data. And then we have this other field called data type, which is just uh, an enum on the different data types, so we can know the data format is used. So the buffer might be a buffer of ints, but we might be switching into a buffer, buffer of floats, and this can be the indication for the different methods we have. And finally, we have a frame position, and the frame position allows us to know as you're reading through the buffer uh, where we are uh, standing. So uh, the format is just a pointer that uh, has a different struct and says we have X amount of channels, the sample rate, the bit depth, and the endianness. So when we do the encoding and decoding, we can uh, keep this information around. Now we have nice helpers to let you set these things so you don't have to do it. And I just wanted to show you an example of how we can create uh, a very basic synthesizer that generates sound and then distort the sound and then store it back to a file. So this is the entire code and we're just gonna go through it quickly. So first we need to create a, um, a buffer and fill it with content. So we define the frequency. So if you remember the, the waveform, um, the amount of times you will cross the, the, the zero line it will be our frequency, uh, which in this case we want a root of A, which is uh, 444 hertz. And uh, we want to sample that at 44,000 samples per second. Uh, and then we have this new generator. So I wrote another small package that says, okay, I want a sine wave and I want it at this frequency and this uh, sample rate and then give me a buffer. Um, actually, in this case, the generator was, it's still the old code, so it was just giving us a big slice of everything. Um, so we get all this information, uh, we send it to an oscillator, uh, sorry, we, we ask the, the oscillator to generate four seconds worth of data, and then we store it into this PCM float buffer. Um, so once we have this uh, float buffer, we basically have a sine wave for four seconds in mono, and we're gonna do some transformations on it. So the transformation is just a function that takes a buffer and another argument, and based on that, it's gonna modify the buffer in place. Now remember, we have a lot of data. We don't want to allocate a lot, so we want to actually modify the data itself. So we simply applying uh, the decimation, which is just math, it's not very interesting, so I didn't show it to you. <coughs> then we're applying another transformation. So I can, cr I can write as many transformations as I want, they're just functions that take a buffer, and then potentially other arguments, and then modify the buffer in the fly. Now, what's interesting is in this case, uh, my oscillator is generating ints, and then when I process them, I want them as floats, so we're converting them on the fly, I'll do a bit crush. A, a bit crush reduces uh, the bit rate, the, the, the sound, the bit depth from 16 to 8 to create some noise and make it more crunchy, like an old drum machine. Um, and then I will resample back to the frequency range, uh, so we don't lose, um, we don't basically time stretch it. And then finally, to save it, we just need to create an, an audio file. Um, we make sure we're going to close it, and then we have our new encoder and then we pass it a few information. So we're gonna be, some, we're gonna be doing a sample rate at this format, that's the bit depth. And then we write and we just pass the buffer and automatically, because the buffer is well-defined format, the encoder can take it and save it to, to file. 
I know it went really quickly, and it's probably not enough for you guys to be able to be like, okay, I'm gonna do that and write it. The point was not for you to really understand how to write this thing, it's more to understand the thought process of designing. So we're still not done with it. Um, I think we rewrote the encoder decoders four to five times, and it might look kind of simple at the end, but it's a process that takes a lot of time because it takes a lot of iterations, and as you do things, you discover them. Uh, you discover that you need to go back and, and redo things from a different perspective. And I think creating a feeling of simplicity is probably the hardest thing you can do. <coughs> I think when you look at a standard library and you th see things like IO Reader and Writer, they seem very, very obvious and simple, but I'm sure it took a lot of time for uh, the language designers to come up to this. They're not compromises, but they, they came up to this right solution that works in most cases that makes it, when you use them, that, oh wow, that's actually nice and, and sim uh, simple. Understanding the, the problem domain is very important, and especially understanding the edge cases. Because edge cases are usually what will, ref will help you refine um, your APIs. Because you can design for the obvious case, and it looks very simple. And often when you take a library from someone else, like, oh wow, they, they really forgot about this, this, and that. And maybe then they did not. It's just that it's going to affect the design. And I think really thinking about it makes a lot of sense. In some cases, you should be able to say, you know what, this edge case, I don't care about it. It's not going to be supported in this API. But it's very important to be explicit about it. Um, another thing that I saw a lot of people do, and I used, to not, I used to not be really good at that, is making sure you spend the time to research what other people did before you. I think it's, it's a bit arrogant to come in and be like, oh, I can do better than all these people, and I'm just going to rewrite this testing framework, I mean we saw, I don't know, 15 of them earlier, and I'm sure they all have pros and cons, but it's very important that before you start doing your own thing, make sure you look at what other people did and why they did it a certain way, even though you disagree. Finally, if you can, I would recommend to keep the scope very small and iterate. In our case, uh, we really focused on just the audio buffer, and that saved us, because when we started at the beginning by just doing um, encoders and decoders, that was really, really big, and we didn't know how we would be able to come up with a good solution. Um, so keeping things small and iterate many, many times, and it can be frustrating because you might be doing it four or five times like we did, and it, every time you rewrite, it was probably four to five hours of work every single time. Uh, but I think this is how you, your design gets better, and if you do it well, like in the case of Wave, AIF, and MP3, these formats, these APIs, might be used for a very, very long time. And that's also why when you send a pull request to the Go team, um, they might be discussing small details, but the small details is really what makes the greatness of an API. So that's it. Thank you very, very much. If you have any questions, uh, please do. Please. I don't know if I have time for questions. I'll take questions in Portuguese or in English, but I might not answer very well on your question. <laughs> E aí, pessoal, alguma pergunta para o Matt? Come yeah. on, just, just pretend, just come up with a <laughs> Okay, uh, tell me, I was, that's the reason I took time to get here, because I was thinking, I was in the back, I was thinking, um, so, for instance, when I transform a WAV file to MP3 file, so I, I'm doing a resample, right? So for instance, I could build something like that to transform it, right? Using uh, maybe create an API in a... Mm, no. No. So when, you, when you're doing a wave to MP3, you actually do a lossy compression. So ah, it's slightly okay. different. So the way it works is it uses psychoacoustic. So psychoacoustic means that as human beings, we hear different frequencies at a different range. So we take a WAV file, and let's say a WAV file is about, let, let's pretend it's 10 megs per second, which is not, but let's pretend it's 10 megs per second. If you have a four minute song, it takes a lot of room. If you want to stream it on the web, it takes too much data because we have all these samples. And MP3 will take this file and apply psychoacoustic and say, you know what, people don't really hear these frequencies as much, and this frequency is gonna mask this other frequency. So they will then compress this information, kind of like zip, if you will, and then we'll make it so 
um, you can have less information in the file, and then it comes out. But when you go through the digital to analog conversion, it's the same signal that comes out. Okay. Also, I've heard some, uh, for example, using machine learning uh, algorithms, some people can manipulate data, and for instance, I don't know, maybe I saw your code, I was remembering this, maybe they could use this. So uh, I could separate, uh, separate noises in other sounds, for instance, in an open area, I could you know, recognize some sounds and feel kind of filter. Yep. Uh, could I say this is a kind of resample? Um, Technically, resampling means you re-stack the sample. sample. What you're talking about is more filtering. So this is also in MP3, that's what you do. So you can convert this amplitude into the frequency domain. So basically, this is just the volume going up and down, right? So if you use a fast Fourier transform, you can get um, an application. In my GoCode, actually, in the Go library, I do support that. So you can get the frequency that you have, and then you can filter that and say, uh, let's say you want to have a you want to just extract the voice of a song, right? So you would apply the filter, and then you'd say anything that's under the frequency range of the voice, I'm gonna drop it, anything on the other side, I will drop it, and then I'll do machine learning on that and see whatever is, it, is keeps going, this is the voice. And what you can do, what's very interesting, is resynthesis. So you take this voice and you make it say something else. <laughs> awesome. Uh, looks like you have a question over there. Uh, hey, uh, Ricardo? Oh, uh, nice, nice talk, by the way. Uh, I can use the, the same technique with uh, telecommunications, VoIP, and codecs, and stuff. Yes, absolutely. That's exactly the same. Uh, there are slightly different formats depending on what you use, uh, but it's exactly the same thing. I also didn't mention, but all this code is open source on my GitHub. Uh, I should have mentioned that. There's also support for MIDI and a bunch of other formats. So. Okay, thank you very much.